having um, a pen name, nom de plume, and what does what protection does that give you? What protection does it not give you? And so, if you are looking at it as being an absolute source of privacy for you to have a name, a, a nom de plume. It can be done. Um, you have to be very cautious and very separate about your entire world and everything that you do between that and any other social media accounts you use. You don't want to link the two. You don't want to connect the two in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean that you're absolutely protected in terms of identity, but it helps. Generally, though, and, and this is something that applies to me it, as well, I use a multitude of pen names, but the main reason I use most of them is because it, it separates brand or sometimes it stops things from confusing different topics. If I am writing as myself, very little, very few things do I publish underneath, underneath my own name, James B. Nettles. And the main fiction ID I use, which is James B. McDonald, is linked. I don't hide the two. There are other things that I write, but a lot of the time it's articles or other pieces that are written specifically for that particular purpose. It doesn't tie into anything else that I'm doing or working on. A lot of it is tech-based. A lot of it is privacy-based. Uh, there is fiction I've written under other names as well. But mainly, to me, a pen name is good for being there for branding much more than, than protection of your identity. I've got a client. Well, I've got several clients I've worked with over the years who have worked in various spaces that continuing to protect their identity is important and it just takes a lot of work and it's one of those things of cultivating your nom de plume as a legitimate identity what about uh situations like facebook where they have a real names requirement does that get in the way uh of a pen name so it has at times and the real names requirement is kind of a joke because there's not currently a protection out there that says, I'm, I also want your social security number. I want a credit card number. I want something along those lines. But it's one of those things where I can tell you that there are authors that have lost their Facebook presences because someone complained and filed, filed an objection that said, this is a gnome de plume. And under those grounds, Facebook came and said, is this a real identity? And has asked for proof of your identity. Uh, that is less of a problem than it has been, but I think in the current environment it could become a big problem again. So it, it is one of those things that, that is a challenge, but a large part of the reason for that, uh, that requirement has been helping cut down on fraud and other problems. Facebook has been largely open to people using a gnome de plume if it is part of their professional life. Mm -hmm. And if it is one of your, if it is a recognized identity. Mm -hmm. So that that's a little bit of a distinction versus I'm creating a fake name to use to go cause trouble. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to mention about that, that you mentioned, Jim, the branding aspect, and that is uh, don't underestimate the power of, of trademarking uh, a pen name, not only to use offensively, but also defensively. Uh, but it also comes in handy with this sort of thing. I mean, if you have, for example, a trademark registration and you, there's an issue with respect to Facebook saying, is this legitimate or not, then you can point to the trademark registration certificate to say, yes, I own this. I'm the real person. This is a registered mark that I use for this purpose. It's going to make the process a lot easier as well. Agreed. Um, does it provide, if you, you're using a, a pen name, does it provide any protection if you have uh, legal issues or legal exposure in some sense, or, or is it really pretty much easy to, to find the real you? Well, I mean, strictly from a trademark sense, I mean, it, the, the fact that you have a name and you might be using a name commercially doesn't mean that someone else might have the same name and might have registered it as well. Uh, you know, whenever you register a personal name, the trademark office asks, uh, is this an individual name and do you have permission from the individual in order to use it? And it's happened before where you know, if you set up a business in your own individual name and you sell that business, including the trademark rights, that on the other side of that transaction, you no longer have the right and ability to use your own name 
you know, for the same goods and services that you just sold, you know, the company or the other interest in. So from that standpoint, I mean, it is something that you have to be very careful about that if you're going to trademark something and you're going to, um, or even if you don't register it, you think, well, it's my name, of course I can use it. That's not necessarily the case from a commercial standpoint. If someone else is using you know, something confusingly similar to your name, you may not have the right to use your own name for that. Um, so there are, yeah, definitely legal problems that can occur. Jim, I think you're muted. There we go. Yeah, I had to go out, go out and come back in for it to actually connect the camera. So one of the cases of somebody I did, had did some work with, and I had a number of other cases come that were very similar. I had somebody that lost their own Facebook identity. It was their account. It was their legal uh, gnome de plume. It was something they had published under traditional publisher, publishers a number of works underneath. And their, their assistant or former assistant, they had a dispute. The, the assistant had all of her IDs, locked her out of all of her identities online. And so she lost her entire following and in trying to work with Facebook was like, well, this is not your actual legal name. This is not your legal identity. Having had that trademark kind of paperwork would have given much more latitude instead of allowing someone to come in and lock them out of their entire social media life. Um, and so there are a lot of reasons to have that. There's also a lot of reasons why you want to make sure you protect that identity and control who has access to operate under your name. Yeah, you see that a lot with domain names also, that if uh, I, I've had a lot of clients over the, the years who, you know, some individual will register a domain name on behalf of the company and it'll be registered in that person's individual name. Then the person leaves the company along with them, the control over the particular domain name, and then trying to claw that back. And, you know, you're counting on the, the goodwill or the good graces of the individual uh, to give it back. And in the meantime, the, the company can lose its entire, you know, website platform because control of the domain name is, is in the name of the individual, the employee who's now left. Uh, so I always advise, advise clients in the corporate context to set up a role account don't register a domain name, you know, for your main company brand or whatever in the name of an individual because a person might leave, they might get upset, they might lock you out, they might just refuse to cooperate in the future. It's just much easier to, to set up a role account than it doesn't matter if the particular employee leaves, you still have control over your own destiny. We're going to see if we had any more good questions out there. Uh, mm. One of the things I do see out here is going into the conversation was a little bit about, do you want to have a social media presence? Do you want to have a website? Do you want to have control over things like a Goodreads page or Amazon page, things along those lines? Well, these should be assets that are yours that you control. No publisher, no agent, along those lines should actually want to own or have control of those for you. So that's one of those things you want to make sure that you also, once again, own and control. One of the other good things I can say about a lot of the social media platforms is if you get into having someone do the admin work for you, these platforms are getting much better about having uh, two user IDs or other tools having authentication IDs so that you can have an admin ID and you can have someone who has more of a assistant type ID so that they don't have full control to change things like passwords and identities, but they can do posts on your behalf and things along those lines. Because these platforms are maturing to be much more about the business side of things, these platforms are driven around the business side of things. They're driven around the marketing and advertising. And much like I, I commented on in the panel, one of the things that you have to be aware of is that again, you're using someone else's platform. You're on someone else's tools and toys. Your website or your website is yours. Your social media accounts are not yours. You are allowed under license to operate on someone else's platform, build an account, 
and operate underneath their rules. And one of the things that's very important to remember is those rules can change any time. And so one of the things I see float around a lot of the time is, oh, well, if you post this on your website, then Facebook can't do this or that or the other. A, that's not how it works. And B, if you are posting around, posting those sorts of things, and you believe that by posting something that says, I hereby say that you, Facebook, don't have a right to use my data, there's one way that you can do that with Facebook. Get off the platform delete your account and go away. Other than that, it's not really yours. It's not your platform. It's not your data. It is your experience to control, however. So depending on how you interact with people online is the one thing that you own and control. And the way that you act online, the way you interact with people and the people you interact with will determine what your ultimate experience is. And I think that's the most important thing is when you're online, act with intent Rep your, represent yourself the best way you want to be represented so that whatever you're doing online doesn't cause you a problem necessarily with work doesn't cause you a problem with other people mm -hmm. and be very clear and intentional in what you do it's, it's interesting it's a, it's a really good point jim that uh, i've had a number of instances in which someone will post something infringing on one of the social media platforms and then you have to try to get it taken off uh, whether it's copyright infringement or trademark infringement or whatever and when you delve into the rules that they have listed in the terms of service it's remarkable all of the things that the social media platforms can do if they choose to do so i mean there's a, a list of probably 30 different things that you're not allowed to do that um, you know, whether it's you know, hate speech or you know, incitement of violence or whatever the case might be, there's an enormous list of things that you think, okay, I might be expressing my opinion on a particular issue that can fall within the, the scope of things that they can, they can totally take the site down on their own if someone reports it, uh, if you're not adhering to their rules. And it kind of underscores your point of, this isn't really yours. Uh, you are you're borrowing someone else's platform, and you kind of got to live by their rules. Well, and I think a good example of that was Tumblr. Uh, Tumblr was at one point a fantastic platform that was built largely on users coming out there, writing, sharing experience. It was very supportive for the LGBTQ community. It was supportive for a lot of different things. And then they decided to go the Disney route. They decided that they wanted to be a much more family friendly site. And they literally stripped away people's assets, their IP content they'd been writing for years and years. And it was gone overnight with next to no warning. So again, because you're working on and playing on someone else's environment, you have to be very aware of what the rules are and that they can change at any time. Someone can change their business model and a profile you spent years building, content you spent years building, can go away in a literal instant. And that's as you say, it's good to have your own real estate on your own website. And back your stuff off, off, offline. Back If you've written it and posted it to Wattpad, if you've written and posted it to Facebook, mm -hmm. and it's something you want to keep, you better have a copy of it offline somewhere because otherwise, again, you may have no control over the fact that it just disappears tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Jim, we got a question. You probably best for this as far as what are some alternatives to Facebook? Um, what do you think? The platforms you want to be on and Facebook is obvious, obviously right now has taken some significant hits. A lot of people have ethically come out and said, I no longer want to be on Facebook. I don't want to use them. I don't want to give them money by advertisers. I don't want to do this. I want to be off of there. Again, it depends on what your intention is with being on social media. If you're on social media because it is a platform where you can reach fans, you can network, you can do all these other things, Facebook is the, the main hub. The second hub where you can reach and network with a lot of writers, publishers is Twitter. If your goal is to do book advertising, 
you have to look and see where your readers are at or the people that buy those books. And the reason I quantify that a little bit is if you are writing YA, you have to know where your market is because that's parents buying it for their kids often or they've got their own, you know, their own Kindle accounts. But also you have a lot of people that read YA that are, for example, mothers 25 to 35 that read that fiction. There's, there's a lot of demographic information. So it's all about what are you intending to get from the social media platform. If it's advertising, uh, Facebook is still your number one choice. Your number two choice is going to be running ads directly on Amazon. But again, Amazon ads work best with warm traffic. Twitter ads don't really work that well. Twitter is also a very hard place to connect unless you are very active. And if you're that active on Twitter, you're not getting your other stuff done. It's a very useful platform for a lot of things. I'm off and on. If you're writing YA, if you're writing stuff for kids, Instagram is a great platform. Also for a lot of people under, I'd say about 45, Instagram is becoming a growing platform. But again, it's part of Facebook. It's part of their ecosystem. It's part of their world. So if you're looking to use these platforms, that's the number one. There are others that are much less regulated that are good places to go and connect that are more open that are also much more niche. So if you're wanting to reach niche communities, I like Reddit. It's, it's one of those places that once again, you have to be very intentional about where you're going and what you're doing. But Reddit communities can be very good and very productive. Uh, you can go in, you can get into very targeted fantasy communities or horror communities or science fiction communities or romance communities. You can niche down and get embedded into a very active community and have a lot more uh, availability to go in there and work. There are other things like MeWe. It doesn't have a big user base. As a very active user base for what's there, it's very targeted. There are some things I'm not fond about with the platform. But it is a place, especially if you're writing in romance or some of these things, you can do cover exposures because they don't have the same levels of, levels of regulation about content. So again, it's really about what you're wanting to do. There's new platforms popping up every day. There's also platforms dying every day. And so if you're wanting to go somewhere other than Facebook, the best question to ask is, what am I trying to do with it and who am I trying to reach? and then look at some of these more niche platforms and go there. So that was a really big non-answer, I know. <laughs> no, you gave a lot of the alternatives. I would have been like, I don't know, I, I don't really care for social media that much. <laughs> well, and I mean, other things, if you're wanting to get more about images and pictures and ideas out there, Pinterest is another great one for authors that most authors don't use. But if you post your covers or you're posting artwork that inspired you, or let's say that you're, you want to post a, a, a picture from you took a trip to see Scottish castles and you want to say, well, this particular part of this castle is what inspired this particular scene. Or you took pictures of this downtown city and you're walking through New York and you're showing this built art deco building built in the, th in the 20s. You can say, this is the inspiration for this. Or it may be because you've worked in the Dakota out of New York into your story. You want to say, you want to know what the Dakota looked like in the 1970s because that's a setting I used. This is what the Dakota looked like in the 1970s when uh, John Lennon lived there leading up to the point in time. You can grab and use pictures and images in that way and build followings, but also because it's tied in so deeply into the Google, uh, into Google and its search networks. It's the number three search engine. Another place that I'm actually fond of using is YouTube. It's a different way of using it because obviously you're, you're talking, you're on video, you're sharing much more, but even Facebook as a platform is rewarding video. Like what we've been building with Continual, it's a video experience. It's people come on, coming on and talking kind of like what we just did here, but Video is the next phase. People are having to become much more comfortable with being on video and talking. Whereas it used to be, I just want to go on and post my response, type it out and go away. Or it's something I could do while sitting 
in the middle of a call and in the middle of a meeting is to, to type out, out a post, it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit more time consuming and you have to be a little bit more ready to be visible. And a lot of writers have visibility issues. They're not even comfortable jumping on a podcast, much less to do something like this and be on face to face on video. It's one of those things where the more, the more media savvy you become overall, the more that you have the ability to reach a bigger audience and for those people to, to learn who you are. Because at the end of the day, that's the experience we want people to get from social media is learning who am I, what do I do, why do I do it, who's the person behind it. Because if people are buying my books, if people are reading my fiction or my nonfiction, I'm getting into their head. I'm influencing the way they think, the way they act, and what they do. And bef largely anymore, before I will pick up somebody's book, I'm going to look and see who is the person. Who is it? Is it somebody who I want to allow into my head as an influence? Freya, got any more questions? I see Ninja out there as well. Just thanks for the tips. Um, <laughs> Ninja? Learning a lot. Cool. Some of the other things I'd, I'd probably throw out there, because if you, if Scott, uh, well, when Scott stops me, because eventually he will. Um, and, and, you know, Dwayne, this is something you might be able to comment on, too, is what do you own about what you post on social media? You know, is because it, one of the things that comes out a lot is, I'm posting snippets of my writing. I'm making them public. Let's say I'm going to post a little bit of a scene out there to use that as either a way to garner readers because they're going to read some pithy comment and go, okay, I need to read the book. Uh, I may post out there. I see a lot of the time people will post those blurbs for feedback. They may post those blurbs out there for, uh, for even marketing purposes to say, hey, you want more of the book? Here's a little snippet. Here's a little blurb. Uh, any any opinion from you, Dwayne, about what that means in terms of copyrights? Because obviously I own it once I've created it, but then you've granted that platform rights to use it. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is in copyright, as you know, that um, you even if you don't register the copyright, you know, the work that you're you're creating, you own the copyright interest in it upon, you know, creating it and putting it in the, the form of expression that it is, you know, writing a song, writing a poem, writing a book, whatever the case might be. You own the rights to that, um, but you can't really do anything with it. If someone is to infringe that copyright, um, you, can't, you can't enforce your rights if you don't have a timely registration. And so on the one hand, it's very useful to post the snippets and look for comment and feedback and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, you're doing so in a world in which you haven't secured the rights to it. And if someone is going to copy that and use it in an infringing manner, if you don't have a registration for that, under the Copyright Act, all you can get are actual damages. You cannot get statutory damages and you cannot get attorney's fees. And speaking as a lawyer, we're really expensive. So you want that in your, your quiver of possible uh, you know, weapons to proceed against an infringer. And that's really the, that's really the big danger. Uh, you post someone out there for, for public comment or feedback or whatever, you have to realize that there's a certain percentage of people who are unscrupulous and lazy and they'll copy it and use it in something else. You don't have a timely registration, meaning you haven't sought registration prior to someone actually infringing the work. Well, the best that you're going to get then is actual damages, which is really, really difficult to prove. Um, so all that long story short is, yeah, there are benefits to doing so, but there are also very big disadvantages. Um, and it doesn't always work this way in the real world, but preferably if you've completed a novel, for example, seek registration of the the novel with the copyright office it's not terribly expensive to do so 
prior to putting it out there for public consumption. That way, if someone does copy it and use it in, a, in an unauthorized manner, you have that timely registration and you can seek the enhanced damages and recovery of attorney's fees that otherwise are just simply unavailable to you. I think some of the other things, uh, so we've been doing the mentor sessions for DragonCon for writers. A couple of the other things I'd say that may have come up over the last couple of days of those sessions with people asking about building marketing. I, in fact, today I've done a couple of sessions with people that have said, I've yet, not yet published anything. I don't have a brand. I don't have a market. I'm still working on my first book. What do I do? Well, in talking about it, social media was one of the big pieces that we actually talked about in terms of how they can start to build a presence. Because if you're waiting until you've published to actually start to do your marketing, you're way behind the curve. If I don't know who you are and you're waiting to start marketing until you have a book in hand or you're 30 days before you have a book in hand and you don't have a network of people and you don't have a network of followers, when your book launches, you better have a lot of money to do your advertising. If you have been working for six months or a year or two years, and part of what you've been doing is using social media as much as we talked about here to network with people and to build friendships, to build relationships with people that create that supportive environment, this is when social media starts to work for you is because use it as the tool by which you stay in touch with those people. Use it as a tool by which you network with people, you introduce people to each other. You can then share work and then you can take things offline. You can have conversations. You can, you know, you can work to deepen those relationships and friendships with people. But to me, that's the number one thing social media is really good for is finding people you can work with and network with. And then if you're doing things, for example, let's say you're coming out with a historical novel on werewolves in World War II. You, if you're coming out with an adventure story that's about that, you can then start going in some of the, the niche groups and meeting people that are interested in that. You can talk to them. What do, they, what do they think? What are they interested in? What attracts them to a story? What takes them out of a story? What are interesting little facts and details? And by building friends with people that are already readers in that space, the next thing that happens when you drop a book, you go and say, hey, guess what I have? And these are people that are going to be invested in it as well because you, they know you. You've been talking to them for weeks, months, years. And you're not going and saying, here it is by my book. You're going and saying, I appreciate everything you've done and helping with this. By the way, my story is out. And when that happens, you go to say, my story is out. And I'm getting a little bit of slack back. But you get to say, it's out, and I appreciate your help. And by doing something like that, working with different groups allows you to meet those people that are going to be most interested. Yeah. It's a good point. It's something that I've been, uh, yeah, I'm getting yeah, feedback on my end as well. Yeah, I'm not sure. To is it okay now? Uh, is that better for me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's gone now for me as well. So again, if you start, if you get into these groups, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. It, let's say you have a strong interest in, oh, you're reading romance and you're interested in flowers. Well, if you happen to get into a florist group and you start asking questions of people about the different kinds of flowers and how a florist shop would work and say, I'm working on a romance where one of the protagonists is or one of the love interests runs a flower shop. Guess what? You're going to have a lot of people wanting to volunteer information about how that works. And so if you're in a position where you are giving, a, a, giving and having conversations with people and asking them how things work where they have knowledge and expertise, they're going to want to help. And again, when you start building that kind of friendship and relationship, when you post that book that says, you know, love in a flower shop out this Tuesday, 
the friends that you've been talking to, they get to go and say, I got to help with that book. They're going to share it out too. And these are the sorts of things that help you build following and build marketing before your book ever launches. And then if you're going to say, well, my book's out there and it's not doing anything. I don't have a social media following. The same things apply. But real relationships online are based just like they are in reality. Finding the people that you resonate with, finding the people you like to talk to, finding the people that you can have dialogue with and avoid the toxic pits that our social media is famed for. Because if you get stuck in those and sucked into those, it, it, it doesn't help. Go to the places for the people that resonate and that you can all help build, contribute, and, and have positive conversations. They're there. It just sometimes take work, takes work to find them. And the other thing I will say is we've seen a lot of these groups go toxic, especially in the last six months. And if that happens, have the connections with the people you resonate with, you interact with on a regular basis, and go create your own thing. Make sure you can work with the people that are best to work with and use the platforms what they're best for and recognize when things are becoming toxic and get the hell away from them as quickly as possible. I've seen it happen more than a few times in the last six months. I, I've seen some groups of 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people become toxic because of the interaction of a few people. And it's... And I've seen it destroy some very, what were very good and positive and productive groups. Not only in fiction, I've seen it happen in the business community. I've seen it happen in the technology community. And I'm very quick to just go and say, yep, I'm out. Do you think it's that's that uh, effect is increasing during the uh, pandemic lockdown? Yeah. Uh, I think that what we're seeing, some of it is frustrations with people that aren't getting social interaction and they aren't able to voice frustrations and they aren't doing the things that they normally would do that let us vent and get things out of our system. For a lot of people, not being at Dragon Con is a very difficult thing this weekend because for this community, it is a great place to go network, meet people, and be with your people. Mm -hmm. If you've not been out and amongst people for months it's a challenge and so what happens is you inadvertently can start to lash out online and once that happens you see the court pop and once that happens you see a flood of people go me too me too me too and i don't mean that in terms of the hashtag me too and the me too movement i mean this in terms of i've got that frustration too and when that court pops if it, if it's moderated right and steered correctly, it's a great pressure release. And people can go and share, I've got this frustration, and here's how I'm dealing with it. But if it stops at that first half of, I'm just so frustrated, I'm just so angry, everybody starts to you know comment onto that, and it, that's all you're getting out of the group, then that's one of those things that I've seen creates a very toxic environment very quickly. The other thing I've seen that's created some toxic environments very quickly is when people go and they try to destroy someone else's work to promote their own. And I've seen that happen very effectively in a number of different groups in the last couple of months where I've seen some people use destruction of someone else's good work to help build their own. And I'm, and if I ever see that, that's someone that goes on my list of, I will never speak to do business with or anything else. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen in the writer community. I've seen this happen in the business community. I've seen it happen in the technology community. I've seen it destroy very large groups. And much like with continual, we moderate everything that comes through. We, you know, it's one of those things where if, is coming in that is going to trigger that we're largely going to lock it down and say that that's not what this group is for um and i noticed in the video i've said i said um more times and i because of i've been editing all of our other videos like i must have really been having a fun day that day the number of times i said um 
if you are out there and you're moderating and managing your group, because if you do start using Facebook groups and things to create your environment and your safe space for things to happen and your supporters and a place to go network for your community, if it's going to remain your community, you have to swing a ban hammer mercilessly. You have to protect it just as hard as you would protect your front door. And I think that's what we've seen people that wanted to be nice and allow things to, to build and vent in their community. They wanted to use them for a safe space for people to vent and they discovered they let it get out of hand. Not to be the Debbie Downer of the day. <laughs> well, we are getting uh, close on time, so uh, um, we will need to uh, kind of start to wrap it up here. If you've got some final closing thoughts, I just I echo what what Jim said as far as the the feeling of you know missing out and not being at DragonCon this year. Uh, it is, you know, it is my people. And I miss that interaction. I miss the in-person thing. And this is, this is a, a nice little alternative to be able to connect with people. And I appreciate you facilitating it, Scott. And I hope that uh, we'll see you in person next year instead of online. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I missed out. Well, I mean, I've had a ton of events this year canceled. Uh, Dragon Con is one of the biggest ones and more, most impactful to me because it's also where I get to see a lot of very good friends, but it's about the only time we get to get together in person and sit in the bar and have a talk, but also the other people I get to meet, the community I get to have, and that's the biggest thing is do what you need to do to grow the community that will support you and make sure you're doing everything to lift up your people in your community. Be supportive and be there for people that, that need it in the best way you can. Mm -hmm. and well, Ninja posted that this might actually be a good Dragon Con for the introverts. <laughs> well, the one thing I'll, I'll tag on here that we've had a lot of good feedback about for Continual because it's all online, is that people who are immune compromised, people who are painfully introverted, people who are not sure how and socially uh, and have social dysfunctions or have social inaptitudes or social concerns can come on and interact and build those friendships in a safe spot. And then when we get to have another Dragon Con again, those are people you can be with in person and hang out with. And that's, again, that's one of the big things I miss. And um, Scott, definitely appreciate you you hosting us and hosting all of this because I do know the work it takes. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, there uh, for the most part, DragonCon is not live streamed uh, to any great extent, uh, and it's something that's difficult. One of the problems is um, uh, uh, just the, the sheer bandwidth it takes, uh, especially with the amount of the number of tracks and and. The hotels will have some limited bandwidth, and uh, it just may not be enough, especially for video these days. So um, that's always been the issue: is is you know eighty thousand geeks and six square blocks, and um, trying to find the bandwidth for all that. So, uh, uh, but it is that that is a um, one upside of being at home is is not having to be any more bandwidth impoverished than normal. So uh, that makes it all. Uh, much possible and and really much better in that in that in that sense. Although, you know, you really miss the miss the in person aspects of it. Definitely. Yep. And and I invite everybody if you come look for continual convention uh, dot com. The website's in is in heavy build out right now. But if you come find the the Facebook group, that'll link you to the YouTube pages, the Twitch channels. And if you enjoyed this kind of a, a digital experience, a little bit of a hybrid experience, you know, please come check us out over there as well. Okay. Well, at this point, I need to wrap it up. Uh, so I'll see you later. We'll uh, say our goodbyes, and uh, we'll see you around. Scott, right. Dwayne, Thanks. good to see you guys. Yeah, Scott, thanks again, yeah. as always. Yep. Take care. And thanks, everybody, that joined. 
Thanks and bye.